Hello, BISC 132. This is the beginning of recorded lecture 4.4. Uh, we started this chapter last time just briefly introducing the different types of receptors, but now let's, let's get into our uh, traditional five senses and beyond. Uh, so let's start with our sense of touch, which uh, formally known as somatosensation. Uh, this employs, uh, unsurprisingly, mechanoreceptors, you know, receptors that respond to mechanical touch and pressure. So here's an example of, you know, a patch of skin. And yeah, there's a lot going on here. I mean, here's the, the outer skin, the epithelial tissue, that stra stratified squamous that we talked about in an earlier chapter. And again, a lot of other things going on beneath this, you know, part of the immune system, sweat glands, fat, all that stuff. This is what we're caring about, the receptor here. So as it turns out, there's not just one type of receptor, there are at least four different types of receptors, uh, mechanoreceptors involved here. Merkel's discs, Meisner's corpuscles, Ruffini endings, and Passini corpuscles. We're not going to memorize all of these. Uh, I, I just want you to know that among these mechanoreceptors, there are four types, and they vary in where they are found on the body. You know, some on the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet and some, you know, everywhere on our arms and head and stuff like that. So they vary in where they are found on the body and what specific kind of stimuli activate them. Again, some of them responding to differing textures, some specific for light touch, some for edges. It gets really complicated. So I'm just going to say four types. They vary in uh, where they are and what stimulates them. Uh, but that's not all. Our sense of touch also employs thermoreceptors, which, I mean, should make sense. I mean, you can touch something and know whether it's warm or cold. Uh, what's interesting about these is they can be tricked. Uh, some of these thermoreceptors on our skin uh, for our sense of touch can be stimulated by chemicals as well. They're, we don't consider them chemoreceptors because they're supposed to be responding to temperature, but there are certain chemicals that can trick them. Uh, this might sound weird, but it's actually pretty familiar to us. Uh, a good example of this is uh, this chemical compound capsaicin found in, in various peppers. Uh, yeah, if you've ever eaten something really spicy, it feels warm, you want to drink ice water, uh, but, but you know, it's, it's all a trick. Uh, they're just triggering those thermoreceptors in your mouth uh, or on your skin. Never tried this myself, but I guess there's uh, capsaicin cream you can uh, you know rub on on parts of your parts of your skin to give you relief from arthritis. But uh, yeah, that would make you feel warm uh, by tricking these uh, thermoreceptors, and it goes the other way as well. Menthol, this chemical compound found uh, in mint leaves, uh, yeah, let me see. We've seen commercials for breath mints or gum or whatever. Tricks you into thinking that your mouth feels cool and you can breathe out ice crystals. And yeah, you can rub this on yourself too. Uh, and this is just another way that you can um, trick those thermoreceptors. So capsaicin and hot peppers feels like heat and uh, menthol from mint oils feels cold. These are chemicals uh, that are stimulating these thermoreceptors. Now, while we're on the subject of touch, uh, we kind of run into the subject of pain. So uh, pain is sensed by a, really a different class of receptor called nociceptors, the receptors responsible for sensing pain. Um, in many ways, pain can be thought of as a sixth sense because it, it, uh, it is separate from our sense of touch or, or taste or smell. So uh, nociception is pain reception. Uh, and these receptors that fall under the umbrella of nociceptors can be uh, stimulated in a variety of ways. Of course, lots of, of pressure and you know strong touch, you know, mechanoreceptors can cause us to feel pain. Uh, thermoreceptors can be responsible for triggering pain if something feels too hot or too cold. And, and there are certain chemicals that can cause us to feel pain as well. So this is kind of a, a bonus sense here I'm throwing in just because it doesn't really fit better anywhere else. But you should know that nociceptors mean pain receptors and, and this, you know, category of receptors can be mechano, thermo, uh, or chemoreceptors. Okay, so moving on to taste and smell. This is going to be quick. You know, we, we can lump these two together because they're both pretty straightforward. Our sense of smell, known as olfaction, and our sense of taste, known as gustation, are both 
uh, just sensed by chemoreceptors. So, you know, whether it's olfaction, these are some olfactory nerves in the nasal cavity, you know, responsible for our sense of smell, uh, or whether they're taste buds uh, in the tongue, at least in humans, they're in the tongue. Uh, I'm zooming in a little bit more to see these receptors. Um, yeah, these are just chemoreceptors that, you know, respond to chemicals to tell us what something tastes like or what something smells like. Nothing, nothing terribly complicated going on here. Um, it is worth noting that here, uh, obviously, we're being very human focused, and, and for most of this chapter, we're being human focused, but it's always interesting to, to note other animals here. Um, of course, there are other animals, like dogs, for example, that are much better at us than smelling and tasting. And uh, the way they do this is uh, two ways, simply by having more receptors. So other animals can have just a higher density of these chemoreceptors, giving them uh, a more precise uh, sense of taste and or smell, uh, or more types of receptors. So there are even, this is funny to think about, but there, there are tastes and smells that, that we don't even we don't even know what they're like because we don't have receptors that bind to them, but other animals do, uh, giving them a more sensitive uh, sense of taste and or smell. Okay, so again, I said taste and smell were pretty straightforward. That's all I've got for them. Let's move on to, to hearing. So before we can talk about hearing, we have to talk about sound waves. So sound waves uh, are vibrations traveling through a medium. And the amplitude of the wave, getting into physics here, but you know, just the light version, uh, the amplitude of this wave corresponds to the volume of the sound. So a softer sound would have a lower amplitude, and a larger sound would have a higher amplitude on this wave. But it, at the end of the day, it's, it's you know, still just vibrations traveling through um, a medium. And I'm saying a medium because it could travel through air, it could travel through liquid, it could travel through solid. Sound waves are vibrations traveling through a medium. Uh, wave amplitude corresponds to volume. Uh, but that's not the only property of a wave. Uh, you, you know, it could be high or it could be low. Uh, another property of wave is the frequency uh, or the wavelength. So when the waves are very closely packed together, a high frequency or a short wavelength, either way you want to think about it, that corresponds to a high pitch. Um, I won't uh, try to imitate a chipmunk voice or something, but we, we know what a high-pitched sound can sound like. Uh, and you know, correspondingly, a low frequency, a long wavelength, corresponds to a lower pitch. And, and we're going to be able to distinguish between these, even though these are both just waves of vibrations traveling through a medium. So wave frequency and wavelength corresponds uh, to pitch. So, okay, let's, let's follow the journey of, of things here. So... We could start with a sound wave, and here's a tuning fork, but you know, a lot of different things can produce sound. Uh, creating the sound wave, uh, alternating areas of high and pressure, yep, there's the, the frequency, uh, the wavelength, the amplitude here. Uh, it's this, these vibrations traveling through the air. Uh, when they make it to our ear, they are channeled through uh, the outer ear, uh, also called the ear canal, just sort of funneling these vibrations in uh, to give us a finer sense of this. So I'm going to number these steps just so we can walk through this, but you know I'm never going to ask a test question. What's step three? The, the numbering is kind of arbitrary. So uh, step one, sound waves are channeled through the outer or the external ear uh, through the ear canal. Uh, when they get to the back of the ear canal, they hit something called the tympanic membrane. Uh, so it, it's at this point that these vibrations traveling through the air are translated into vibrations in a solid. So the tympanic membrane, also known as the ear drum, uh, translates those vibrations into vibrations in bones. Uh, sorry if these are kind of blurry. Ah, here we go, this is a little bit better. Uh, so the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, um, it's fun, fun Latin trivia. They're named after what they look like, the, the mallet or the hammer, the incus or the anvil, the stapes or the, the stirrup. Uh, the other fun piece of trivia, this is the smallest bone in the human body, uh, the, the stapes here, one of these three bones. So anyway, the important thing is these vibrations are now occurring in these three bones. So now we're having vibrations in a solid. So vibrations hit the tympanic membrane, and they cause movement in, um, I don't even need you to memorize the names, just three small bones is, is all I'm going to say. 
So from here, the these bones or, or the last of these three bones is going to vibrate against a structure called the oval window. So th this area is called the the middle ear. Uh, you know, so we went from the outer ear or the external ear to the middle ear. Now this the stapes bone is vibrating against the oval window. Uh, that's going to lead these vibrations into what's called the inner ear. This uh, this curly spiral kind of snail looking structure called the cochlea. So the bones vibrate against the oval window. This leads to the inner ear and the, the bony structure called the cochlea. Uh, so here we're going to zoom in on this cochlea, uh, but uh, sorry to not be disorienting. We're going to zoom in on the cochlea and look at a cross section of this of this bony snail looking structure. So that's what we're looking at here. This is uh, a sideways view, a cross section of that cochlea. And we can see uh, it's filled with three chambers of uh, what's called cochlear fluid. And the vibrations are now in this fluid. Uh, and so there are waves of pressure in this fluid that are going to bend cilia located on hair cells. Okay, so this is our actual receptor that's uh, that is sensing these vibrations. And if you, you know, pick up on this, what is actually triggering them to start an action potential? It's vibrations in the the tectorial membrane, this this tectorial fluid. Um, that's a mechan that makes this a mechanoreceptor. It, it's weird to think about that our sense of touch and feeling things is the same thing as our sense of hearing. But yeah, vibrations are movement, and and what we're hearing are those those waves of pressure that movement is triggering these hair cells. So mechanoreceptors are responsible for our sense of hearing. So anyway, vibrations cause pressure waves in the cochlear fluid. And this pressure bends cilia on hair cells. Uh, here is another figure showing this uh, zoomed in even more. Uh, and yep, these are the hair cells. There's their cilia. There's the, the tectorial membrane that vibrates. And yeah, it's going to cause them to start an action potential. So bending of the cilia causes depolarization of the hair cells, which are mechanoreceptors. We did all this in the last chapter, but that's going to start an action potential and it's going to be relayed to the brain. Now, uh, this makes it seem very straightforward, but you know, as, as I you know, said just a few slides ago, there are all different types of sound, amplitude, frequency, all of this stuff. Uh, there are different hair cells located in different parts of this cochlea. So here, here's the, the short version of this. Uh, different regions of the inner ear are moved to different degrees in response to sound waves of different frequencies. So that is what is going to allow us to distinguish between a high pitch and a low pitch. Uh, just different regions are being moved, and so different uh, neurons, different receptors are being stimulated. So now we come to another kind of bonus sense. Uh, so here's uh, here's the cochlea uh, that we just talked about, and attached to this cochlea, the, the bone sort of extends out this way, uh, is something called the vestibular system or, or this vestibule. And yep, a lot of loops here and other structures. Uh, what's located within this vestibular system? There are there are more hair cells. Uh, but they're not being stimulated by, you know, movement of sound waves. These hair cells within the vestibular labyrinth, as it's called, are, are stimulated by, uh, by gravity, uh, by acceleration, by deceleration, by, by your body itself moving around. So, like I said, this is kind of like a bonus uh, sense, not traditionally thought as part of our hearing, although it's associated close to the cochlea. This vestibular system, the vestibular labyrinth, which is in the inner ear, contains hair cells that respond to the force of gravity, the force of acceleration, the force of deceleration. Uh, this allows us to, you know, sense when we're accelerating in a car or a roller coaster or something like that, or, or to feel when we're decelerating. And it also helps give us our sense of balance. So again, sort of another bonus sense here, our sense of balance, the vestibular labyrinth is responsible for this. Okay, next up, we've got our sense of vision, our sense of sight. So once again, uh, before we talk about this, we have to talk about what it is we're actually sensing. Uh, when we see stuff, what we are seeing is light. So here's an 
old figure that may look familiar from disk 130. Uh, what we're seeing is visible light here, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So radio waves, microwaves, uh, visible light, x-rays, gamma rays, these are all the same thing. This is all electromagnetic radiation. The difference between radio waves that are passing harmlessly through us right now, gamma rays that will kill you pretty much instantaneously if they hit you, and visible light, which you're just, you know, passively perceiving with your eyes right now, is the wavelength. So yeah, light, just like sound, uh, is, a, is a wave traveling through a medium. So um, just background here, light is a type of electromagnetic radiation, and different types of electromagnetic radiation have different wavelengths. Uh, the only ones that we can respond to, uh, or, or that we can sense, are the ones that are appropriately called visible light. Okay, eye anatomy. There, there's a lot going on here, but I'm going to just try to hit the, the simple parts here and, and ignore a lot of the things that we that maybe, maybe don't need. Uh, light comes in uh, past this outer part called the cornea, past the lens. This is the part that can be adjusted. So you hear lens and maybe you think the, the lens of eyeglasses or a microscope or something like that. Those things are, are made of plastic or glass. Uh, but the lens in our eye uh, is a structure that can move around a bit more. So you can see ligaments you can see muscles attached to this lens. Um, changing the shape of this lens is what allows us to uh, change what we're focusing on, whether we're looking at something that's close up or whether we're looking at something that's far away. Uh, so yeah, it's got the same name as a, a lens of glass, but it, it is a much more dynamic structure attached to muscles. Uh, and then the light waves move on into the retina, uh, which you know houses the, the nerves that we're going to talk about, the, the receptors that we're going to talk about. So yeah, here's, my, here's my summary of that. Uh, light passes through the cornea, past the lens, the shape of which is adjusted to focus images, uh, to the retina, which houses photoreceptors. Uh, so there are, uh, th these are the neurons, there are a bunch of photoreceptors located in each eye, uh, and they come in two types. Um, the type we're looking at here is called a rod cell. So you have a cell body which contains the nucleus, you've got the, the point where it hooks up to other neurons, because of course once it starts an action potential it's got to, you know, relay it to other neurons and make its way to the brain. Uh, but this, this outer segment uh, is what contains a bunch of photopigment discs. And here, here is where it can kind of get complicated if you get into the biochemistry of it, which we will not be getting into, but just to show you this so you can appreciate it. These, these pigment discs respond to photons of light. Uh, they, they change uh, their, their chemical shape, uh, and that is what's going to allow us to respond um, to light on, like a, on a chemical level, starting an action potential when these chemicals are converted from one shape to another, which happens because of photons coming in and, and striking these chemical compounds. Uh, again, <laughs> it quickly gets uh, very, very complicated, but, but this is you know, kind of an overview of, of what's going on here. So um, photoreceptors, uh, there are many in each eye, two types including rod cells, the, these, uh, these are very sensitive because, you can kind of see here, there are a lot of pigment discs stacked in this outer segment. So this allows us to you know, be very sensitive to, to light. Uh, these rod cells are particularly good in low light environments because they are so sensitive. However, just the, the types of photons that, that stimulate these chemical changes, these rod cells can only distinguish between black and white. Uh, the pigments here just can't distinguish between these different wavelengths that correspond to different colors of light. Uh, so under under low light conditions, if it's you know dark in your in your bedroom in the morning and you're trying to find the blue shirt to wear, uh, in, unless you turn on a, a bright light, it's going to be difficult for you. Our ability to sense color is very limited in low light conditions because it's just the rod cells doing this, and and they can only distinguish between black and white. So of course that was just one type of photoreceptor, the rod cell. Uh, the other cell is called a cone cell, and yep, they're they're named after you know what they look like. That uh, in the outer segment, this kind of looks like a cylinder or a rod, and yeah, this is more tapered at the end, so it kind of looks like a cone. Makes sense to me. Um, 
uh, in contrast to rod cells, which were black and white only, cone cells are responsible for being stimulated by different wavelengths of visible light, by different colors. So cone cells come in three types. They have different photopigment chemicals uh, that can be stimulated by different wavelengths. Uh, so these three types of cone cells correspond to the three different colors. Um, if you were to ask a, a painter or a visual artist what the three primary colors are, they, they'd probably tell you uh, red, yellow, and blue. But in our eyes, just the way our biology works, the three basic colors are red, blue, and green, just the, the different types of, uh, of cone cells that we have. Uh, and so whether it's a rod cell or a cone cell, once it receives this stimulus, it's going to send an action potential to the brain via the optic nerve. And back to this eye anatomy here, you can see the optic nerve there, going to send to the brain the central nervous system to uh, interpret this information and, and make sense of what it is that you're actually seeing. So, okay. And that is the, the end of the, the sensory systems chapter. So moving right along, we have a lot of these systems chapters. So each one of these is going to be fairly short. Uh, moving on next to the musculoskeletal system. I do not have a good segue for this, so we're just going to jump into this system. So uh, we have, we've talked about skeletons already a little bit in, in previous chapters. So this might sound familiar to you that there are three types of skeletons found in animals. Uh, one of these is a hydrostatic skeleton. We saw this in several groups of invertebrates, but here is one of them, the, the earthworm here. Uh, hydrostatic skeleton is defined in the key terms again. A skeleton skeleton that consists of aqueous fluid held under pressure in a closed body. So pressurized fluid makes up the skeleton. Uh, another type of skeleton that should look familiar, exoskeleton, seen here in an arthropod. An exoskeleton is, reading from the key terms now, a secreted cellular product external skeleton that consists of a hard encasement on the surface of an organism. Oof, okay. Uh, and finally, endoskeleton. I want to pause for a second to appreciate uh, how metal this image is. I, I did not dig this from the depths of Google. This is actually the, the image found within the, the biology OpenStax textbook, this human skeleton riding a skeletal horse. Uh, anyway, uh, endoskeleton is defined in the key terms. Uh, a skeleton of living cells that produces a hard, mineralized tissue located within the soft tissue of organisms. So the skeleton is inside as opposed to the skeleton being outside. And so, yep, review these definitions if, you're, if you don't remember them from the previous chapters. Now, a lot of what this chapter is dedicated to is uh, all the different bones uh, and how to organize these and how to name these. There are exactly 206 bones in the adult human body not sure how many bones in the adult horse body, but 206 of these in the adult human body, and every single one of them has a specific name, and we are just not going to be bothered with that. So, uh, nope to all of this stuff. Um, in Spanish this time, no to all of this stuff, no to all of this, nine to all of this. Uh, one quick takeaway I, I do want to point out is what the skeleton actually does. Does. I, I think the big picture is important in, in an intro class. So the job of the skeletal system, uh, there are several jobs. So the role of the skeletal system is to support our weight, to, to hold us up, especially outside of water. That's very important. It's also to protect the internal organs, if you think about our, our rib cage, uh, and to provide, and, and this is a big one that can easily be overlooked, a major role of the skeletal system is to provide an attachment point for muscles. And we can see this when we look at hydrostatic skeletons. They're doing a pretty crummy job of, like, hard protection. This is just pressurized fluid. They don't really prevent, you know, puncture injuries the way an exoskeleton would. And they're not really great at supporting weight either. I mean, these, these earthworms are pretty low to the ground. They don't have to really gallop around like a horse does. But what a hydrostatic skeleton does, and, and every other type of skeleton does, is uh, allow something for these muscles to push against, to work off of. So that's why this chapter is called the musculoskeletal system, the skeleton and the muscles are closely associated with each other 
you need a skeleton for your muscles to work. If you didn't have an attachment point for muscles, they would just sort of you know, squeeze and contract back and forth, but they wouldn't be able to actually move anything. So uh, important to, to appreciate the skeletal system is an attachment point for muscles in addition to all this stuff. Um, also, if we want to get human-focused, the human skeletal system does a couple of things uh, in addition to all this. The human skeletal system also stores minerals uh, and produces blood cells. So we'll see more on this when we get to the circulatory and immune systems. But uh, yeah, human skeleton does, does these things as well. Uh, so, okay, uh, moving on to the next section. More of this stuff, yet uh, on all of this. Uh, yay uh, on all of this. Uh, all I want to say about joints uh, here is uh, just to define what they are, because again there are a lot of different types to memorize and actually different textbooks sort of break things down differently and it's even more confusing. Anyway, uh, joints exist where bones meet one another. Uh, there are many different types enabling many different types of movement, whether it's you know the joint in your knee or the joint in your elbow, a joint along your spine, uh, not breaking it down just know they exist where bones meet and there are many different types. Okay, so that's it for the skeletal part of the musculoskeletal system. Now let's move on to the much more, in my opinion, interesting uh, part of things, muscles, how they work and how they contract. So let's start uh, zoomed way, way, way in. We're gonna zoom out in a second, but zoomed way, way, way in at a muscle cell. So muscle contraction is going to be powered by the movement uh, or, or the interaction between two basic types of filaments. Uh, thin filaments, also known as actin filaments, and myosin filaments, also known as thick filaments. So thin filaments or actin filaments are made of Actin, and there are other things going on here, but they're primarily composed of this protein called actin, uh, which has a you know pretty generic overall globular shape to it. Uh, in contrast, these thick filaments, these myosin filaments, are composed of a protein called myosin. Uh, but what's interesting here is the structure of this protein. It's it's really it's really unique among proteins. The, the myosin protein has this structure that kind of looks like a golf club in my opinion. It's, it's an elongated protein with a globular head domain. This is gonna be important when we talk about how it works, uh, but yeah, we should know just the terminology of these two filaments. So muscle fibers, uh, th these are muscle cells, contain two types of filaments. Thin filaments made primarily of actin proteins, thick filaments made of myosin proteins, and you should know myosin has an elongated shape with a globular head. So again, this was this was zoomed in as, as far as we could go. Uh, if we zoom out a little bit, we can see you know these lines, the, the blue line is meant to show a bunch of those thin filaments, the red line is a bunch of those uh, thick filaments. Um, here is an individual myofibril, and then we can put a bunch of myofibrils together uh, to make an individual muscle fiber, to make an individual muscle cell. And of course, put a bunch of muscle cells together to make muscle tissue. So we, we really have a lot of these proteins going on in, in, uh, in muscle tissue. So many of these filaments, actin and myosin, come together to form myofibrils, and there are many of these within a muscle cell. So the actual movement here, when you want to talk about how a muscle contracts, uh, has to do with how these uh, two filaments interact with one another. Uh, unfortunately, I typically run out of time in this lecture before I can and talk about that, and I definitely don't want to have to rush through this. Uh, so this is going to be our cutoff, kind of a cliffhanger here. We will uh, talk about how muscles actually work and how they contract uh, in the next recorded lecture. But this is the end of 4.4.